some sexy things, just let me know. So today I'm kind of trying a new sort of video. Uh, I've got a friend who is a huge fan of Life is Strange and has been telling me to play it for months, and I kept saying I would. Since Life is Strange is a game that came out episodically, I thought it might be interesting if I sort of reacted to it episodically. What I'm going to do is record a video like this after I play each episode, sort of give them my thoughts on how it's going, uh, what I think of it so far, where I think it's going to go. Then at the end, I'm gonna just put the whole thing together and see if I get an interesting video out of it. If I do, then awesome, success, and I'll do videos like this for more episodic games in the future, probably. Going into this, you should know that I've played the first, like, 20, maybe 30 minutes of it before, before my laptop just kind of crapped out and I gave up on it. All that I really know about the series is that there's a rewinding time mechanic, uh, it's heavily story-focused, I've heard there's something about lesbians, I also am aware that there are like secret pictures that you can get in every chapter, and I'm a huge sucker for that kind of stuff, so I'm gonna be doing that. I guess that's all the setup necessary. Let's... let's wreck this train. Do you think Naruto and Sasuke are like, fucking to make this thing happen? No. Oh, hey, what's up? Eh, not much. I just did the intro for that video. Oh, uh, Life is Strange? Yeah. Haven't we just gone home too? I, I, I don't know. I, I haven't played it yet. Oh, well, the internet said it sucks. Yeah, well, that's, uh, that, that's what they do. Why are you making a video about it? I don't know. I just thought it'd be a fun experiment. Well, at least nobody will see it. Yeah. Yeah, well. At least there's that. <laughs> Alright, so I just did the first episode. One of the first things that I noticed is that as far as like cinematic games go, uh, this game is probably the one that I've played that's handled like the music aspect of, of being cinematic the best. I, I, I think people don't realize how much music actually like helps tell stories visually, uh, sometimes in TV and film, and uh, Life is Strange does a really good job of using its music to do that. Uh, there's a part right at the beginning where she puts in her uh, her earphones and it plays like the, you know, the beginning title comes up and it's just a very good moment. But there were also a lot of super cringy lines. Anybody hurt her will get a skate posse and take them out with her boards. Some guys in their 30s and 40s were, uh, were writing what they think kids sound like these days. There's also a lot of characters that are just kind of irrevocably douchebags in this. Since you know all the answers, I guess you have to find another way into the dorm. We ain't moving. No. Oh wait, hold that pose. So original. Don't worry, Max. I'll put a vintage filter on it right before I post it all over social medias. Now, why don't you go fuck your selfie? You are trying to be a bad person at all times. And it makes me hate them. I, I think that's probably the point. Uh, I don't think I was supposed to hate her friend Warren, though, but god, he annoys me. If you're talking about characters with, like, really forced, cringy dialogue, the entire scene with him, uh, was just a- it was- it was a treasure. So, did you get a chance to check out the movie booty on my flash drive? That said, the beginning, like, the- the introduction of, uh, your rewinding time powers is really well done. They bring you into it really well. Not so well with the puzzle aspects of it. Uh, there were a lot of times where I was doing like the, the puzzle solving aspect of like the whole reverse time thing. I'm hoping that it's just like this in the first episode. Because um, it kind of felt like I was just being forced through a two or three hour tutorial. Uh, for something that wasn't that hard to grasp and didn't need that much of a tutorial. Where this drew me in was with the introduction of Chloe. Uh, once Chloe comes in the story starts moving in a better direction. There's a lot of just like petty drama where I'm like, oh great, I'm playing an episode of Degrassi. Uh, that 
was not compelling. Helping sort out the drama of somebody sexting somebody else's boyfriend. Not into that. It, it, was, it was hard to care about in comparison to this whole, hey, you have a supernatural ability and you just save somebody's life with it. To go from that to uh, petty drama is annoying. I'm hoping that that stuff kind of weans off because the ending of the first episode did a really great job of kind of introducing what this story is actually about. So I'm really hoping that this means we are going to be moving into a more compelling, uh, focused, tightly told narrative through the rest of the episodes. Uh, it also introduced more of a supernatural element, and I, I would love that. I, I'm curious to see what they're going to do. They're trying something, and that is, that is huge to me, to be playing a game that's trying something new. I will always give that a chance. If you watch any TV show, uh, the first episode is usually one of the weakest episodes they have, because it's all the setup. It's, it's, it's all of the work and none of the payoff yet. I'm genuinely excited to play the second episode. The little teaser that they showed uh, seemed interesting and seemed like it would be a huge departure from the first episode. So, looking forward to that. I mean, the problem with story-driven games is that, like, you know, they get worse every time you play them, right? What do you mean? Oh, you know, like, what you know what's gonna happen, like, you know, just the cutscenes kind of lose their appeal. Well, I mean, you know, they're good. I guess if the gameplay is good enough, like, you can just skip the cutscenes and, you know, keep playing, but you can't really do that with a game that's all story, right? Like, I love Phoenix Wright, right? But, like, I, I know who all the killers are now. You know, like, I, I can never play it for the first time again. So, what, do you just never rewatch movies? No, not really. Well, how many times do you watch the movie? Well, episode two wasn't really what I expected, and not, not really in a good way. I, here's the problem. Uh, episode two felt a lot like episode one, and I just mean it like structurally. It still felt like I was just being introduced to the concept. By the end of episode two, you're, you're, you're like five-ish hours into the game now, uh, and you're two-fifths of the way through, uh, through, through the whole thing. You know, at the end of episode one, it was like, okay, this game is going to be about stopping this tornado. This tornado is coming for Arcadia Bay, and this is what this game is going to be about. That did not wind up being the case, at least not during episode two. Episode two, you want me to hold you? Episode two wound up being, um, for the most part, inconsequential uh, when it came to the tornado. Uh, it spent a lot of time dealing with stuff that had nothing to do with it. In fact, I, they only even briefly, lightly touched on the tornado. And it, it, it's not that it's not that I have a thing for tornadoes. You know, when you're writing a movie, uh, they, they tell you to trim the fat. You know, if, if a scene isn't pushing the plot forward, then it's actively holding it back. And that is time that could be better spent elsewhere. With games, it doesn't happen that much. And it's really not that important in games, uh, generally. I, I love RPGs. RPGs are so full of side plots and just random things that have nothing to do with the plot. They serve like a gameplay purpose. It's, it's about, all right, you go do this side quest and you get some reward at the end of it, or, or it fleshes things out more. It, it's just, Life is Strange doesn't have that. This is a cinematically oriented game. Everything about it is these cutscenes. It's, it's about telling the story. So when you have scenes that have nothing to do with anything that seems to matter, uh, you feel it a lot more than in the average game. What this episode seemed to be about was about Kate attempting suicide. Now, granted, this is probably one of the strongest parts in the game so far. The scene where she is going to jump and you're going to save her, uh, that was fantastic. Some of the dialogue was forced, honestly. Uh, they make it really obvious that you're able to save her based on the choices you've made. Like, I helped by erasing all that crap people wrote on your room slate. And they basically choose to communicate it by having Max sort of just rattle off the things that you've done in a very strange laundry list sort of matter. Uh, it doesn't feel natural, it doesn't sound natural, but that's just kind of a recurring problem with the game, but I'll get back to that in a second. Much like the first episode, episode two ends on a very strong, 
uh, compelling note. But that great scene came after an hour and a half or two hours of just kind of wandering around. Max and Chloe are just kind of hanging out and they don't really care about the massive tornado thing that they were just freaking out about at the end of the first episode. I was really counting on episode two to focus the narrative and so far it hasn't and it needs to focus it or it's gonna be really hard to stay invested. It also looks like the puzzle aspects aren't gonna get any better. I use puzzle extremely lightly, but there were two in particular that I had like a pretty major problem with. Uh, the first is one that should have been a really tense great scene. Chloe gets her foot somehow randomly stuck in the train tracks when she was just laying there. I, I, I don't know, it's, it's convoluted, but whatever. That, that's the setup. She's stuck on the train tracks and there's a train coming. Of course there is. There is no reason in a post Stand By Me society why people should go anywhere near train tracks. So it's this really tense thing of like, you've got a time limit before that train gets there and runs her over. And so you go looking for like all the stuff that you need to be able to fix it. And uh, I found all the things, I was running back to fix it. And on the way back, the train came and I was like, well, gotta rewind. So clearly what this is gonna be is now I have to race against the clock to go and grab all the stuff I need and get back and fix it in time. Cool, I'm down for that, that's tense. So I rewound time and uh, I kept all the stuff that I had gone and picked up. It pretty much established that when you rewind time, uh, you don't rewind yourself or anything you pick up. You don't undo any of your actions really, unless you want to. So it basically just took all of the urgency out of the situation. I could go as slow as I want. Uh, doing everything and all I would have to do is just see the train come like I don't know no, no, get back there They took out the tiny bit of challenge that that puzzle could have actually offered So that was unfortunate that that really took the jamba out of my juice And then there was just this random thing where it was like hey go help Warren with this experiment So they go and talk to him and he's like I don't know if I should put p potassium or sodium in here and uh, they're all wrong You get a third option and that's also wrong So then you go talk to the science teacher and she tells you the answer and then you go back and it's right and it's like okay well then why didn't he just ask a science teacher also what is this experiment also what does this have to do with anything basically gameplay has just been not great and, and i'm not asking for a lot but it's just such a cool mechanic to be playing with that i, I just i feel like there's a lot of missed potential that said there is still some interesting stuff happening with the narrative some mysteries keep coming up i am still interested but man the fact that this is a game made by a bunch of french guys who are trying to write American teenagers, that is really coming through. I bet you want to blow apart those old computer monitors. Let's reboot them with a bullet. Old school. And you know, honestly, in any other game, this writing would probably be perfectly fine, but when you're going with a cinematic game, you really gotta try and make your writing as good as a film's. Because the story is all that Life is Strange has. So it's got to be done well. And I still have faith that at some point, all of these threads are going to come together. All of the petty drama and the tornado and the Rachel Amber, I'm sure it's all going to come together into something. It's just right now, I'm not actively doing anything to pursue it. She's just sort of bouncing around from problem to problem as they come up. And I, it needs focus. It needs a goal. It needs something to push it forward. At least in the opinion of this unvetted little boy who has never made a game. I don't know, you know that shit where you're like, you're, play, you're playing a game and your parents are trying to relate to you? And they're just asking shit like, are you winning, son? Uh, I, I guess, yeah. It's like that guy who made a game for you. That sounds like a relatable situation from everyday life. And they all got like special snowflake syndrome too. It's the worst. <laughs> what a meme. She's like, a, she's like a monologue where she's like, ugh, these pretentious East Coast photographers. They're not, they're not real artists like us. They're so pretentious. Good thing you're never like that. Yeah. You're not like those other hipsters, Chris. Don't worry about it. Otherwise, I might not be enjoying this friendship. Hey guys, I just finished episode three. Also, it's really cold today and uh, the, the landlord hasn't turned our heat on for some reason. Send help. This episode was an improvement over the last two. Mostly the gameplay. Like we started off with like a pretty cool puzzle when it came to getting into the principal's office. You know, this whole thing where I was just like rolling my eyes. I was like, okay, okay, all right, we're gonna blow the door open. There's gonna be an alarm and the alarm went off and it was like, oh God. And I realized you gotta go into the principal's office and then just rewind 
to before the bomb goes off. And because you get to keep your location, you don't just manipulate time, you also manipulate space. You, then you get to stay in the room and then just open it from the inside. And it's like, oh, it turned from like, come on, into like, ah, oh, yeah. Then you also had like a really cool scenario inside the diner where you have to talk to people uh, to get some information, figure out how to push other people's buttons, rewind now and then. This is how you can use the, the conversation system to make like an interesting kind of puzzle gameplay segment. Then there was also like a, you know, hiding from the Nazi stepdad segment that was, uh, it wasn't really challenging, but it, it was slightly tense. It was cool, it felt like a little bit of an accomplishment. So I mean, that's good. There's nothing wrong with that. There's still some issues with really stilted dialogue where I'm just like, this feels real force. Like, it's definitely like a writer came into this like, this is what the scene is supposed to do. I'm just gonna have them do this thing without thinking about how it relates to their characters and the situation and context. They're just gonna do it. The overall plot isn't that bad, but the, the dialogue, it gets bad at times. It also ends with another huge twist that uh, seems really irrelevant to everything leading up to that point. Not meaning it doesn't matter. Clearly, it, you know, it matters. You, you bring Chloe's dead dad back to life. Really, her dad has nothing to do with the episode until like the last half hour of it. And then it suddenly becomes like, all right, hey, you can uh, look at pictures and go back in time and save her dad. And now everything's happy, except she's suddenly a cripple now. So... Whoops. I still feel like I'm just kind of waiting for all of the pieces to come together. Because obviously now I'm gonna have to try and find a way to stop Chloe from uh, being in a wheelchair. But you know, like that whole last cutscene, it's how I saw some whales like wash up on the beach and it's like, yeah, weather's still freaking out. So you know, me going back in time and saving her dad clearly didn't do whatever I need to do to stop all this weird weather stuff from happening. The tornado's still probably gonna happen, but I still just don't see how it's all supposed to come together. Cause now Kate has seemed to have nothing to do with this entire episode. She's been there, everybody's been talking about it, but she hasn't really affected much. And this is one of the things that always becomes a problem when you write a story with, uh, with, with like player choice is since Kate could possibly die, that means the story had to be able to move forward in a way where, you know, it could still happen if Kate wasn't around anymore. It made it kind of feel, now that you've saved her, like, uh, it was kind of inconsequential. I'm really pulling for this game to, like, nail the last couple episodes because it, it keeps building stuff up. I'm just waiting for it all to pay off, and I, and I hope that it does. I hope that it doesn't just drop a lot of stuff because there are so many elements at play now that I just keep forgetting about some of them and then getting reminded of them and being like, oh yeah, this is a thing that's happening. Nothing I can really do about it other than just uh, play episode four tomorrow and see where it goes. If I'm alive, send help. So how long have you spent looking for those uh, uh, photos? Not that long actually. It's uh, not as hard as I thought it'd be. I always thought it was really weird that she just goes everywhere with her camera. I mean, she is a photographer. She takes it everywhere? That's what she does all, all the time? It just doesn't really feel realistic. It doesn't feel natural. I mean, you don't go everywhere with your film equipment. Good point. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we beat episode four and it's happening. It's, it's, it's happening. It got real good. Uh, this is by far the best episode. At the very beginning, you're dealing with like the, uh, the, the fallout of the end of the third episode, the fact that you're in this alternate reality, and uh, you basically discover, man, life is awful. Chloe even, you know, ha ha has you kill her, so she doesn't have to live in that world anymore. I guess it served as like a sort of a look what happens when you try to mess with the past uh, kind of thing. I, I don't know if it was really necessary, uh, but once that's over, uh, as sad as it is, you get back into uh, just the investigation, and you have just investigation this whole chapter. There's a point where you're putting all the clues together, and you actually have to look through all the stuff that you've gathered up to that point, and, and, and connect the dots, put things together, and it was like, yeah, this is fantastic. This is like a great way to use this gameplay system. You actually have to think. It's really engaging. It makes it like, it, it's great. And this actually made the plot development a lot better. Instead of just watching it all happen, you figured out certain clues. When I was looking through the list of things that Nathan had been buying, uh, and saw GHB on there, uh, I was like, this is how he's drugging people. Because GHB, or Georgia Homeboy, uh, that's a date rape drug. Don't, don't ask how I know that. 
it all comes together. You find like the secret room where people have been taken. Uh, you find what's happening to uh, Rachel and Kate and just whoever gets drugged at these parties. Uh, you find Rachel's remains. Just everything starts escalating and it all leads from one thing into another. It doesn't feel meandering. It all feels focused. This is what the story has needed and it is so strong right now. And I don't know if this is just because that's been taken care of for me, but it also seems like the dialogue was a lot better. Uh, Warren, in particular, was a lot less forced with his dialogue. He, he was consistently the character where I was just like, they are trying way too hard uh, to write this guy. But he's actually written pretty well in this episode. And just in general, uh, the writing felt a lot better. The dialogue did. But once again, I, I don't know if it's just because uh, the, the focus and the gameplay was better, so I, I didn't notice stuff like that as much. Uh, but I think by far, this was the best episode. Uh, I kind of had a sneaking suspicion from the beginning that Jefferson was going to like churn out to be like a bad guy. You see enough stories, you start to realize when they're building up the uh, whole like mentor who is, seems like the perfect good guy but is actually a bad guy. It just definitely seemed like, alright, this guy definitely has like a front. Also, fucking hipsters. When he showed up at the Vortex Club party and he was like clearly on something, I was like, okay, I, I got a feeling that he's going to be in league with Nathan. I'm not sure how involved he is. I don't know if one's using the other. I don't know whose idea was in the first place, really. Uh, but that's what the next episode is for. Now that all the stories with like Frank and Rachel and Kate and Chloe and David and all of that is kind of tying together, and it's now like one neat like yeah, this is actually a pretty good like not exactly murder mystery, but just kind of like a good mystery. Uh, the one thing that's left that I'm kind of waiting on is how the supernatural element ties into all of this. Uh, so far. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any real explanation for why all this stuff is happening, and it seems really unrelated to the, uh, the disappearances overall. But I have no doubt that is going to be what the next episode is. I, and, I, and I hope that it's executed as well as this one, because this is the episode that just flew by. You also really started seeing the consequences of your actions in this one, uh, mostly when you have to deal with Frank. Thankfully, the choices I made leading up to that point uh, resolved itself in nobody getting hurt. I mean, Chloe got shot through the head. I have a sneaking suspicion that I'm gonna blue skidoo into that picture that Warren took uh, right before the party. Uh, and that's gonna be my way of undoing uh, Chloe dying and stopping Jefferson and all of that. That, that. That's what I'm hedging my bets on right now. And I'm making myself wait till tomorrow, but I, I, I really don't want to. I'm trying to give myself one day between each episode to uh, fully experience like the, uh, at least somewhat, the episodic nature of it. If I just played it all straight through, it would kind of ruin the point of the experiment, I think. It sucks that it took four episodes for me to get like this into it, but I'm glad that it eventually did, uh, because not that many games do. Alright, one day left. And election day is tomorrow. It really is the end of the world, isn't it? The smell in this room, it's horrible. It smells like death, like blood. Okay, but what does the card say? <laughs> I actually did that joke once. <laughs> if you guys oh, could go back in any conversation in like 30 seconds, wouldn't you want to do that? Just to make sure that every conversation you had, you said the right thing. I don't know, I'd rather just avoid conversations in the first place. I kind of feel like part of just getting along in life is being able to accept that like you don't always do the right thing. Right? So like to just go back and fix everything all the time, to be perfect, would feel disingenuous. It wouldn't seem human. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. You're only yeah. saying that because you don't actually have the power. If you could just rewind time 30 seconds and make every little aspect of your life perfect, everybody would do that. Humans are obsessed with power, they're obsessed with what everybody else thinks of them, what they're actually thinking. It'd be constant. It's like when you Google the strategy guide on GameFAQs. You know it's there, you're just gonna keep going back to it. It'd be endless. It's done and I cried like a baby. That's uh, that's the end of the review. Go. It took the momentum that had built up in the last like one and a half episodes and it followed through, it delivered on it, and it gave a choice that there's a fly in here. God damn it. It ended with a choice that took into account like everything you've been doing up to that point and was really satisfying. It didn't pull a Mass Effect 3.
I guess, is the point. The ending made me super curious what the other ending would look like. I, I chose to sacrifice Chloe, um, because it seemed like it would be the more powerful ending, and I... Whew. Somebody just keeps honking their horn outside. The ending I got was a super powerful uh, set-to-music cutscene that was paced perfectly. Uh, it, it was... It would have been perfectly in place in like a really good movie. And ultimately, I guess that's kind of what Life is Strange has been. It, it, it's felt kind of like an experiment in how we can take these cinematic techniques and make them work in a game. And I think Don't Nod did it better than most people so far. I don't want to say all because I, I haven't thought through every cinematic game since then. They did choice really well. You started seeing the impact that these choices had in both small and large ways and it led to a very emotionally satisfying conclusion. I really do want to see the other ending, just because I want to see if it was as well done as the first one, uh, but I chose to do this video before I look up like all the stuff I didn't know. You know, before I go and educate myself on the game, I just wanted to go purely based off the experience that I had. And the experience that I had, uh, more or less, was being kind of intrigued for the first couple episodes, uh, but not quite. The experience that I had was being kind of intrigued for the first couple episodes, but not quite being pulled in, being a little put off by the gameplay, being kind of like baby's first walking simulator. Uh, and some of the dialogue was just really badly written. Around the third episode, it started picking up a bit, and then the fourth and fifth episode were just fantastic. They were paced perfectly. They had really interesting gameplay segments. And the plot wound up resolving itself really well. There was one snag I had. There's a part where you go back and you churn in Jefferson before any of the stuff happens, so that now, like, none of the bad stuff that happened in the game, like, happens anymore. And that's great. However, you also enter your photo in the Everyday Heroes contest, and you win, and you go to San Francisco, and then the tornado hits while you're there, and you're like, ah, shit. I, uh, have to go back. So then you go back, and you tear up the photo right after you take it, so now you can't enter it in the contest, and now you're captured by Jefferson again. And, uh, all the good stuff that you did the last time you went back, didn't go through. And I guess it was kind of saying, like, you, you know, you go back in time and you get to change one thing. So when he went back to, like, a certain point and you churn Jefferson in, uh, that was great. And that, you know, that, and you can look at the text and it shows that, uh, you didn't know any of this stuff. Like, your consciousness went into that bit for a moment of time, enough for you to turn him in. And then you left and you're back to being, in, in that timeline, I guess, you were back to being the Max who didn't know any of this. So you were genuinely surprised when Jefferson got arrested. So I guess that makes sense. Then when you jump back even further from like, before when you turn Jefferson in, you, you now have stopped yourself from actually turning him in. I guess that makes sense, but then it's always just like the thing of, okay, why didn't you tear up the picture and then also, you know, turn Jefferson in? Like, like just send that text real quick. But I understand it was like a storytelling thing, and I guess it was kind of to establish the rules because there was really no reason to go back to the dark room. You could have gone into the rest of the game without having that segment, I guess. It wasn't bad though, you had like a really good scene with David, so I'm not upset that it's there. Uh, it just felt like a bit of a sidestep in the pacing when uh, otherwise it had been really, really tight at that point. Other than that though, it was really well paced. You get resolutions for all the characters and they all feel good. I guess the only person you don't get a resolution for is Victoria, but... If nothing else, Life is Strange excited me because it showed me that we can make really interesting games, not just story-wise, but even gameplay-wise, uh, through this kind of cinematic walking simulator sort of experience. There are going to be people who say, ah, oh, it's just talking, like, this doesn't need to be a game, you can just make it a movie. And I would say that Life is Strange definitely earned its place as a game. You could not tell this story through a movie to the same effect. You just couldn't. Like, the interaction was a huge part of endearing these characters to you and also uh, making the story have such a huge impact. And the idea of manipulating time and making different choices uh, was played with in a way that you could only kind of capture in film. You just can't do quite the same thing as you can with a video game. It's a different medium. I was also a huge fan of when it got abstract near the end. From a gameplay standpoint, there were some really interesting things done with it, but mostly from a writing and psychology standpoint, it was fantastic. I mean, Bojack Horseman is one of my favorite shows, and uh, one of my favorite episodes in particular is Downer episode, which is like the second to last episode of the first season, I think. Because it goes into this 
bizarre abstract representation of all the characters' anxieties and fears, and Life is Strange basically did that in just playable format. What they really did with it that was fantastic was they used it to emphasize both sides of the choice that you have to make at the end of the game. When you have to decide whether you're going to either let Chloe die so that the tornado won't, uh, you know, destroy Arcadia Bay, or if you're just gonna, you know, save Chloe and just say fuck it to the whole town and everybody in it. And this abstract little dream sequence thing does a great job at emphasizing both your relationship with Chloe to just kind of like tug on those heartstrings and remind you of all the stuff that you guys have done and like really play up that relationship while also presenting this like fear of, hey, are you gonna kill all these people? Are, are, are you going to let everybody die? It hits you with that stuff like right then and you don't realize what it's for at first. Then you get to the end and uh, you get you gotta choose. I also have to give props to Don't Nod. Uh, their dialogue writing did get better as it went on. Uh, I think they really learned from the mistakes in previous episodes, and you can see those things being fixed as the game goes on. If they do another season of this, or if they just work on making more games in this vein, uh, I'm really excited, because by the end of this, they, they, they had hit their stride. I think as long as you're open to the idea of games as a storytelling medium, uh, you won't be disappointed by this. And thanks for joining me on this weird uh, experiment kind of video. I have no idea what this is gonna look like. Uh, I have no idea how I'm gonna put this together. I'm just winging it at this point. Hopefully it came out good enough that uh, I'll do more stuff like this in the future, along with, you know, the more standard kind of analysis videos. Thanks for watching, guys, and uh, I guess I'll see you later. I don't know how to say goodbye to people who aren't here. I don't know how to say goodbye to people who are here as well, but when you're not here, it's even harder. Oh, hey, how's the video? Good. Have you decided what you're gonna do with your four million subscriber video yet? Four million? The channel's successful? Yeah, it paid for your musical about homeless buccaneers. Wait, I made bum pirates? Dude, I gotta tell Colby. Who's Colby? Hey, your roomie, would you like a pie? No, that's, that's fine. Well, I got three cooking in the oven, so if you get the hanker in, they're there for you. Yeah, no, you can, you can have them. Oh, sorry, I don't eat. Oh, I don't know if you were planning on eating the cake that was in there, but I sure didn't. Do you still need those shirts ironed later? Because I'm up for that's it. That's a little out of my comfort zone. I took all of your DVDs and I alphabetized them, so you know exactly where they are. Yeah, that, uh, that, there, I feel like there's a boundary there, and you're- You know what? Ugh, freckle past the hair. I gotta go pick up your laundry that I was doing. See you in a minute. <laughs> okay, have fun. I hate it. I respectfully disagree, but that's okay. Because guess what? Now, we can watch President Bernie's inauguration. Isn't it? Election day? Yeah. They got so excited, they canceled the election and inaugurated him on the spot. 
Oh, great. I gotta go. Long story, but I went to an alternate reality, and I was really successful, and the world was a better place. But we weren't roommates; we we never met. And you changed it? Thanks so much for watching and giving me so much of your time uh, to see this video all the way through. If you liked this and want to see any more of my work, here's another one of my game analysis videos, and here's a pilot that I recently shot and cut together with uh, some of my friends. If you'd like to support me in uh, making more things like this, uh, please check out my Patreon, and uh, leave some comments below letting me know what you thought, what I can improve on, all that sort of stuff. Um, I, had, I had a blast making this, but there, there are definitely some things I wish I'd done differently. As they say in France, c'est slavey.